Welcome back. You tuned into Inspired Afternoons with me, Maria Mia. And yes, today, as promised, has been filled with inspiring people that uh, give uh, create give a positive contribution to the South African landscape. And my final guest, I think we saved the bus for last because this is a sister who's making waves. Uh, soon you'll hear her name everywhere. Uh, she's currently MEC Finance for Free State. And that is none other than Ms. Khadija Brown. She's she's en route to the Turkish mosque as we speak as well uh, to partake with a, a solidarity iftar as well for, to, for today, inshallah. Uh, but today our focus is going to be financial literacy for that, a financial literacy for women and young girls and female empowerment because that is something that is close to her heart and that's for her foundation that she works on as well. So um, this segment is brought to us by uh, Nazir Mohammed. He's a Liberty Advisory Partner, Wealth Management and Financial Ad uh, Advisory Services. And um, Liberty is leaders in wealth and investment management. And Nazir himself is very passionate about uh, female literacy and empowerment uh, projects as well. And when it comes to advising females in terms of long-term saving for the future. So he's, this uh, segment is sponsored by Nazir Mohammed, who is a Liberty Advisory Partner. And with that, let's give a warm welcome in a Salah Media warm welcome to uh, MEC of Finance for the Free State Province. And that is our kindred sister and beloved sister, Khadija Brown. Assalamu alaikum, ahlan wa sahlan, my beloved sister. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah, Sister Marim Mia, and also to your sponsor, Liberty, and all your listeners. It's so wonderful to be on your show this afternoon, and we are deeply honored and grateful to be here. So, um, I th fi finance is in your blood, is in your veins. I mean, uh, you studied, you have a Master of Business Administration that uh, you're busy at Henley International School. You've studied economic policy and planning. You have a bachelor's in management and leadership, e e economics and finance uh, from the University of Free State. You've been in corporate South Africa for 15 years, commercial banking, private banking, public sector banking. Uh, you've been with the Pre Free State Provincial Government for nine years as Chief Financial Director of Small, small Business Development. You are the CFO there, a member of the provisional register and now you find yourself in the hot seat uh, keeping the public purse there in the free state province as well yeah so uh you know we're in good hands when it comes to talking about financial education especially for females so uh first tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of your role as mec and how did how did you come by in terms of being nominated for this important, important portfolio as MEC for Finance? No, Jazakula, and um, it's a long journey. I started my finance fashion when I was maybe 15, 16. My dad had a very small shop in the, in Fort Elizabeth. They call it Tebe Canal. And he used to ask me to do stock taking. So stock taking and asset management and do the books. And I could, you know, pick up here and the dad here is this missing, that missing. Now I gave this to the to the neighbor. I gave that to that poor community person. And of course, um, the culture of giving was always there. Um, and then I started doing the books for doctors, entered Standard Bank, studied, moved to the Free State, studied there um, and worked for Standard Bank for about 15 years. Um, I looked after the Free State Provincial Government portfolio and um, when I exited uh, the account executive public sector position, um, the head of department of economic, small business development, tourism and environmental affairs at the time requested me to do a project under the portfolio of um, the account executive at Standard Bank as partnership with government on um, saving money for government towards security officers. And when I presented that to the executive, there was a position that had just um, been pronounced by small business development, a new ministry in government, and they asked me to look after that position. And that's how I entered government in the administration. I was a CFO, a DDG, an HOD, 
And uh, later, during the um, uh, 2019 elections, after assisting the leadership and, of course, all the MECs at the time and our politicians in and being deployed by the African National Congress, we did a lot of uh, campaign work and groundwork and I was nominated then to become the MEC of Finance. It was initially very difficult for me to accept because I'm not a career politician, but um, I had, and it has been a wonderful journey, incredible learnings, very difficult, but exceptionally rewarding because I could <coughs> see a lot or, or much of the progress that we've made. Uh, so since 2019 to date, we've had five clean audits. Um, there had been no clean audits during that time. We were in financial uh, accruals of about 7.4 billion rand, which now we built reserves of about 200 million. We've had um, month on month overdrafts of 1.2 billion, and um, I stopped overdrafts, invested uh, the cash, and I was able to build some interest income, which helped us a lot with those reserves. And uh, we've seen irregularities, we've seen the fruitless and wasteful expenditure, the accumulated numbers reduce, we've seen 57% of improved audits. And I think that um, it has been a long journey, it has taken us a while, we ha we've had to build systems, including in municipalities, which is so, uh, I think the lag effect there may be two or three years. But there are still a, there's still much to be done. But we've got systems in provincial government departments now. And I believe that um, as we're going into this new elections, uh, those systems would be able to take the next administration forward and a legacy that we've been able to put together to ensure that we maintain what we have built as a team. So first of all, we want to thank you and congratulations to you in terms of the, like you said, five clean audits now that you have had, because remember, um, this was actually a major talking point, uh, Free State and the finances of Free State during the state capture with the Estina Dairy Saga, the amount of um, co alleged corruption that was going on there. Um, the, the, it was, it, it, some uh, municipalities had to be under administration as well. So it's been a long road and clearly, from what you're telling us, there's now uh, systems and checks and balances put in place also in terms of procurement and things like that. Do you have a new system or better? And do you have certain warning signs or alarm bells when it comes to pr state procurement, uh, especially in the free state province? And what are some of those systems that have been put into place? So we've, we we had, but we further introduced CFO forums. So every month we have a session where all CFOs um, meet and supply chain management meet. And we uh, have conversations about changes in, for example, instruction notes or national treasury instructions or changes in the preferential procurement systems or if there is any new legislation that has come through. We also, uh, we don't have physical systems, but nationally, the entire country is linked to a system called BAS and a system called LOGIS. And those systems help with some of the compliance matters that we need to deal with. So our consumer database automatically, if they are not tracked, tax compliant, uh, they definitely are red flagged. So when a tender goes out and we're able to assess that tender, we're able to see if the compliance status is correct. But I think if I need to get to the root of the issue, I largely would talk about the technical matters, the matters where it allows individuals to be able to evaluate and adjudicate an award a bid as an example. But first and foremost, we had to ensure that every single bid went through a, a tender process. Everything above a million goes through a tender process. Anything under a million is quotations. And um, we also ensured that where there were big ticket tenders, um, for example, if there is interest where functionality is um, aligned for, for example, 3,000 bids at a time, we would be able to look at a um, method where we test uh, and we deal with the prudency of that that um, 
tender. So treasury cannot be, for example, a referee and a player. So we allow the department and its accounting officer to go through the process from specifications to um, evaluation. And just before award, uh, they would refer that process to us as treasury. I've got a very detailed team that does the review and to ensure that all the checks and balances have been put in place with recommendations. And we'd send that to the department before the award had been made. And where we do feel that they would require outside uh, support, we, we've got a panel and framework of um, auditors that can come in and assist us with a review and audit of the process before we hand it over to the department again. It does take a little bit longer, but it has been able to assist us in reducing some of the irregularities that we've seen in the past. Uh, just listening to this, I think I feel a lot more confident in terms of, you know, taxpayers' money is going where it needs to go in terms of improving in the country, improving structures, improving our utilities in the country, improving in infrastructure. And the fact now that you uh, there's many, many checks and balances that uh, have been introduced. And like you say, something can take longer but at least then uh, MEC Katija Brown can rest at ease at night as well that you know what everything has been done in terms of checking everything before anything is awarded to any company for any project so um, now that we've got that out of the way we'd like to now focus on your philanthropy and what's close to your heart in terms of um, what you do for financial literacy, especially for women and young girls. And you also sit on the advisory board member of the University of Free State. And no doubt there also you must be campaigning and advocating for uh, female students in terms of their support them in their careers as well. And also I'm sure with postgraduate studies, support them in their uh, PhD studies and things like this. So tell us uh, where did this, uh, what do you do currently in terms of this uh, meaningful uh, uh, empowerment uh, across the province or is it uh, nationally as well? It's, currently, it's um, it's across the province. I, I would say that it, because of the media exposure and the social media exposure, it does reach nationally. But the passion started when I was much younger. Um, I Before I got married um, and I worked, I could tell that my salary was going into con consumption. I was just spending uh, for clothing, for work and all the nice things and I didn't, I didn't feel like I was saving for anything. And I decided to buy a very small property. Um, I think I was 23 at the time and um, I used that as a bond and later used the bond as a leverage tool for me to purchase and do other things, acquire other assets and so on. Uh, I used it as a deposit because over time uh, the bond appreciated, uh, inflation assisted and uh, we saw value in that property. So um, for me, a part of the other passion that I see in the work as I do as a community leader is where young girls are feeling obligated to not only gentlemen or um, parents or family members because they do require financial support and they're unable to leave um, toxic relationships or they're unable to bring across boundaries when it comes to toxic relationships. And similarly, um, older grandmothers, and you find with their youngsters in, in the very rural areas, when, when young people have got the opportunity to work, they hold that financial, um, psychological card with grandmothers. No, granny, you can't watch TV now. You can't do this because... Uh, I'm not going to get you your coffee or your tea or your Coke or your your uh, pap or whatever it may be. So I find that uh, finances and money can be a tool that can liberate a young individual um, or it could actually create an environment where young people are stuck in situations. And part of the poverty trap that we have and that we're seeing is that young people are getting into a lot of debt. So even if they're earning and even those who are on the social grant, debt together with cash loans, together with um, those in positions that have got debt, do become um, susceptible to 
uh, socioeconomic challenges and trying to get them out of those areas. So many times have I paid uh, 500 rand for a residence to get a young person at university to stay in their residence and instead of sleeping on the street at night. So what, what we've done um, throughout this term uh, over the past three years with social media and partners such as Liberty, Old Mutual, the banks and the financial sector at large and individuals, we have created what we call the financial literacy program with Treasury. And because I was a banker and a private banker and an advisor, um, it was easier for me to talk about how to save. Uh, how to look at social um, savings, how to deal with um, your income and how much to put away, how to, for example, uh, for Muslim, uh, uh, any newborn child, you can do a Sharia banking fixed deposit that matures every five years. And if you place 2,000 or 10,000 in there, the maturity rate um, is, is larger because the interest is higher as an example. And that can help for a young person's future. Uh, and when it matures over five years, you can reinvest the full amount and uh, that can go for education. It could also assist with any financial challenges that somebody can have. And it's just maybe 150 rand a month that you could put away in a charia a fixed deposit or any type of savings account. Uh, apart from that, it's just to work smartly with funding, but also to understand what rights a 16-year-old has, what rights um, you would want to put together in a will or an in, a, in an estate, for example. Uh, Allah forbid if a family has to go into an accident and you left with a 16, 17, 18-year-old and the estate is being taken over either uh, buy trust through the bank or uh, some other mechanism and what does a young person do then in order to invest and keep their family's legacies behind so what I've tried to do is structure the financial literacy program in different tiers so that we have the very low income and, and poverty tier talking about how to for example, uh, do sustainable farming at home just to create some income. Um, how we look at a, the networks where there are rural enterprises that has the social grants, but also a social society scheme to be able to look at economies, economies of scale to create further and additional income where the price point is less in buying and purchasing. Um, so it even extends to the business side and the income side. And then the middle tier where we have got salary earners and then the upper tier as well. So we, we, we've got young, young girls um, that has got funding through investments or funding through their parents or the NISPAS or um, we've got uh, environments where there is uh, income and environments where there are no income at all and we provide guidance towards how to create and generate income and we've also worked with the central university of technology because um the equality that we're seeing in in this digital space the ai the metaverse is allowing for anybody with very little skill to come in and be marketers come in and do uh, digital uh, marketing and digital selling and that has been able to offer, um, you know, a non-income earner something over a period. And we've been able to assist young people to do that. So it's an ecosystem. It's still got a lot of work. We've got much to do, inshallah. But I've got a little foundation that I've started not too do long ago. It's called the Khadija Brown Foundation. And I hope that um, over the next couple of years, we could do this in a full-time uh, way with different sponsors and partners and, and try and assist also those who uh, across Africa and the world, those young people and young women who require to be independent, require financial independence, uh, those who do not have family members come out of a bad marriage as an example and require assistance to to become, um, you know, a little bit more independent. We, we hope to offer that to many other young girls as you well. You know, when you... Everybody I interview that is doing something, adding uh, such positivity and walking your talk in the South African landscape, they always say it's a little, but for me, it's that small step and that small near that, that just amplifies, it's small action that amplifies and it has ripple effects. So, yes, you know, in between your very, very demanding work schedule, the, I mean, you are uh, official of the, uh, you know, government official as well, you have 
a lot on your plate in terms of that. But making time for this now, you've got your Khadija Brown Foundation uh, over and above what you do in your capacity as an MEC as well. So for me, it's it's the little steps that make the huge impact. And we, we commend you on that as well. So um, I've got two WhatsApp questions here. I'm going to, one is going back to, um, you know, when it comes to politics, it's politics season, Khadija. So I'm I'm sure you you already used to uh, okay. answering questions. That, sure. right, so, okay, sure. so let me, yeah. No so falter, me, no falter. No falter, let me fire away. So I've just got this message from a WhatsApp line that they said, your recently tabled multi-million rand budget has been criticized by the opposition parties as wasteful expenditure so please can you comment on that yeah of course the opposition parties are going to state it's wasteful expenditure yet they pass the budget but um it is it is a political uh, period and uh, what the political parties are really saying is um the baseline at this point what they meant is that due to due to the process of us having to table a budget prior to elections so when the elections happen after the 29th of may there will be a new cabinet and we are we we are not certain what that new cabinet may look like and that new cabinet would obviously uh, have a new MEC as an example or there may be new members of that cabinet and there'd be a new budget tabled and new budget votes would be tabled. So at this point in terms of administrative compliance and legislative compliance we've had to table a budget and that budget it costs a, a Costed us probably about just under a million rand. We had it in the rod saw, we had to feed people and so on and so forth. But that budget was tabled so that the baseline figures could be allocated onto the system and that government would continue to work between the 1st of April and the 29th of May so that no services in government stops between the time now and the election time and that we ensure that we pay suppliers, we pay salaries. So that had to be tabled and we had to go out to communities, bring about, because it's part of compliance and public uh, participation. And we had to ensure that um, from, from a public perspective, the budget was tabled in front of um, members of the public. So I think what the, what the opposition meant there is that the money spent on tabling the budget would have um, been wasteful expenditure. But because of compliance reasons, yes, we, we've had to table it. In terms of other um, fruitless expenditure, if I can just talk about the budget in itself, we've also looked at programs that are current. So we did not add any additional program or new programs to the budget. We did not pronounce on, for example, a new project in the Department of Health because we would want the new administration to determine what those projects are. So, of course, the opposition is going to have some reflections on that and wanted to see something that was fireworks or bells and whistles. But what we've had to do, unfortunately, was compliance. And like the, the minister had to comply to a medium term expenditure framework over the next years, uh, given an election here, um, I'm sure a new minister should, uh, and heaven forbid it doesn't happen, a new minister comes in and he has to table a new budget with new actions. So unfortunately, it is um, a process of election year, election year, and there is a section in the PFMA that does allow for us to do it. So I can motivate to the Auditor General and I can also motivate to the public as to why we are doing two budgets in the one financial year. Okay, so let's see if we'll get any other. I hope that satisfies the the question and I hope your answer was adequate for uh, somebody who sent the message. And then I've got another question here and that is now coming back to our dean in terms of Islamic. What is your advice for young Muslim girls who aspire to be in politics and what character traits are required uh, to be in politics. Yes, I know you need to have uh, politics is not for the faint hearted. So I think one of the characteristics you have to have a, a strong face and a strong heart to take it in a thick skin as they the proverbial thick skin. So some advice for uh, young Muslim ladies that want to enter the, the field of in the area of politics. 
I'm, I'm going to provide my experience and my opinion. So this is not uh, researched, but for me, um, I think first and foremost is understand who you are as an individual. So once you un understand and know who you are and what your core and your ethics and your your intent and your purpose is, you, you have to understand what that is. Nothing would be able to sway you because you can get lost in the bells and whistles. You can get lost in the power, the, the effect of having uh, so many opportunities at your hand, so many people around you. But if you know exactly what your purpose is and what your core and your, your ethical um, intent is, I think that is where it starts. And it's very difficult um, because wh what, I've, what I've done is I have made provision in the position that I'm in not to make any decision by myself. So that every decision from a fi financial decision to a decision of appropriating funds to a municipality or a, a department, it needed to go through a process where there'd be more than one person signing or agreeing or resolving through an exco or through a memo that allows us to be able to do whatever it is that we do. And that was my protection. Um, and furthermore, if you feel that something does not sit well and it doesn't seem to be correct, you must stand up and you must talk about it. It had been very difficult for me because as a young girl, I used to be very shy. I was. It was very difficult for me to stand in front of a classroom and do a speech as an example. But there was a lot of work that I've had to do on myself and understanding myself in order to be able to know exactly how to deal with the work from a technical perspective and then the work in decision making and lastly the question that i ask myself every single time when i make a decision monetary or otherwise is and this i learned from the bank actually when i take this decision what impact will this decision have on greater humanity for future generations to come or what impact will this have on the next or, or uh, it's it's um area or the ecosystem in totality and that question really talks to how is it that you deal with something to ensure that that uh, decision is not made from an emotional perspective but also a, a perspective where it could create um, some sort of uh, premise towards other effects going forward going forward into the future. Lastly, I'm working on something now because we're not sure what will happen after this election and I'm still revisiting my purpose. So depending on what I would want to do going forward, I'm asking myself what is superficial, what is materialistic and what is your, your true purpose? What is it that the spirit or your soul is asking you to do and achieve going forward? And for example, is having bodyguards something that I need or is it the ego, is it a materialistic, is it superficial or is it really because you need to be protected as an example? Do you need that? Yes or no? Um, and that is largely to say, okay, going forward into a further career, uh, I'm used to all of this, these niceties that government has been able to provide in this position. But do I really need those niceties to pave my way forward? And that then takes me back into that discussion with myself, first and foremost. And how satisfied would I be going into another role that does not have these niceties that an MEC does have? It? So um, it's about a discussion and a talk. And, and, and of course, Allah is your guide. So you speak to the Almighty and you ask for his guidance and Alhamdulillah. <coughs> but um, Miriam, one last thing. Let me tell you, uh, I'm not going to sway away from how difficult it is to be in a government position. Municipalities across the country is going to get a lot more difficult to lead. And largely it's about management. So anybody who is out there wanting to come into government, know how to deal with management, know how to deal with people and know how to pull multi horizontal and vertical teams together to be able to ensure that you can manage well. Otherwise, it will not be a success, unfortunately. Political environment is very difficult. You can see what's going to happen over the next month. It's going to be crazy season. But inshallah, everybody who is in those positions, I wish them the best of luck. 
and to all the new members who are uh, on lists to go into national and provincial, I also wish them all the best of luck, inshallah. Shukran, uh, Katija Brown, and shukran for telling it to us, Lars, and it's not all roses in that it's very difficult, as you've uh, pointed out, and you've been honest. So thank you for your honesty in that regard, and we wish you all the best for the future, and we and 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 like you say, uh, you need to have, I think, one of the best traits to sum up what you said is that internal moral compass always be your guide. Let that moral compass, I think that's the most, just uh, put it in a nutshell and to enclose that, what you're saying is that moral compass will always be your guide no matter what field you go. And uh, whatever ho uh, the future holds for you, come post uh, 29th uh, May, we make dua that whatever you do in whatever capacity you continue to serve Dean and you can continue to serve humanity and make a positive difference and impact in the landscape of South African society and looking forward to many many uh, lovely uh, inspiring motivational conversations with you sister Khadija Brown en route to Turkish Masjid so if you want to have a iftar in solidarity uh, join sister Khadija Brown there on her way to the Turkish Masjid this afternoon for iftar and this segment was brought to you by nazir muhammad who is a liberty advisory partner wealth management and financial advisory services so uh, you can check him out and contact him for financial uh, savings and wealth management uh yes uh, somebody said he doesn't like the term wealthsmith but i think that's the new term they they've called them nowadays uh, until next week, may you all be under the mercy and protection of the Almighty. This is Maryam Mia, and this has been uh, Inspired Afternoons. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum